published this work, it was under a pseudonym, or more precisely, a series of pseudonyms. The story of these pseudonyms is as complex and implausible as a whodunit. The manuscript itself is said to have been found in a secret drawer by its editor, Victor Eremita, whose name stems from the ancient Greek word for solitary or outcast. Eremita studied the handwriting of the manuscript and decided it was the work of two authors, a civil magistrate by the name of Wilhelm, referred to as B, and a nameless young friend of his, referred to as A. The papers written by Judge Wilhelm, B, contain two treatises in the form of long letters, followed by a sermon, which, according to Judge Wilhelm, was written by an obscure priest from Jutland. Among the following papers is the famous Diary of a Seducer. In the preface to this, A claims that he stole this from a friend, Johannes. This claim is denied by Victor Eremita, who suggests that Johannes the Seducer is probably a creation of A, and that A's claim to be merely the editor is simply an old novelist's trick. But Victor Eremita complicates the issue still further by suggesting in his preface to the entire work that his own editorship may be a similar disguise. Once again Kierkegaard had found himself in a pickle, which he characteristically worked up into an agony of indecision. Put simply, he wished to hide behind a pseudonym, yet at the same time he wished to make it obvious that this was a pseudonym, or series of pseudonyms. He didn't wish to expose himself as the author of such autobiographical material as the Diary of a Seducer, which was all about his relationship with Régine. Yet he makes it plain in the text of this diary that he wished covertly to communicate this information to Régine so that she would be aware of the profound agonizing he had gone through. Many unphilosophical readers, attracted to this work by its sensational title, may find themselves disappointed. Needless to say, no actual physical transgression is described. But all this tedious and embarrassing nonsense did have a serious purpose— as part of the dialectical approach that permeated his thinking, Kierkegaard wished to put forward ideas from a number of different points of view. No single point of view was to be taken as correct, or authoritative, or even as the author's. The reader was left to make up his own mind over the often conflicting ideas expressed. In order to overcome the appearance of didacticism, Plato had couched his ideas in the form of dialogues. But Kierkegaard was a solitary— and his adoption of the Chinese box form would seem to be more appropriate. In his case, the arguments were taking place inside a single mind. The ground of his philosophy was the subjective. But what exactly did he say in either or? Fundamentally, Kierkegaard suggested that there are two ways we can live our life, the aesthetic and the ethical. Each individual has the opportunity to make a conscious choice between these two. Here lie the seeds of existentialism. In making this choice, the individual must accept full responsibility for his action, which will characterize his entire existence in the most fundamental manner. Individuals who choose the aesthetic viewpoint basically live for themselves and their own pleasure. This need not be a shallow attitude to life. In working for our own pleasure, we almost invariably work for the pleasure of others too, if we are thinking in the longer term. Indeed, it could be argued that the scientist who selflessly dedicates his entire life to curing a painful disease, sacrificing personal, domestic, and social pleasure in the process, is also living the aesthetic life, if he does this simply because he enjoys scientific research. And in the context of modern psychology and the liberal society, it is difficult to see how anyone doesn't live the aesthetic life. In our weird and wonderful ways, it seems we all seek pleasure." Kierkegaard's lack of empathy with this point of view was characteristic of his time and place, pious pre-Freudian Scandinavia. But his analysis of what it means is subtle and profound. He knew what he was talking about. He had lived this way in his student days and was still racked with guilt over the element of it that remained in him. On a basic level, the individual who lives the aesthetic life is not in control of his existence. He lives for the moment, prompted by pleasure. His life may be self-contradictory, lacking in stability or certainty. Even on a more calculating level, the aesthetic life remains experimental. We follow a certain pleasure only as long as it appeals to us. The inadequacy of the aesthetic viewpoint is fundamental. This is because it relies upon the external world. It expects everything from without. 
In this way it is passive and lacking in freedom. It relies upon things that remain ultimately beyond the control of its will, such as power, possessions, or even friendship. It is contingent, dependent upon the accidental. There is nothing necessary about it. If we understand such things, we see the ultimate inadequacy of the aesthetic existence. When an individual who lives the aesthetic life reflects on his existence, he soon realizes that it is lacking in any certainty or meaning. Such a realization often leads to despair. This despair may be repressed or ignored, and it can even be forgotten altogether by living a respectable bourgeois existence. In other cases, an individual may come to see this very despair as the meaning of his life. Perversely, he will reassure himself that at least this is certain. If nothing else, this is something of which he cannot be deprived. Like the tragic hero, he may even take solace that he is fated by nature to such despair. In this way, he can take pride in his heroic despair and achieve a level of tranquil understanding. But Kierkegaard is quick to point out the flaw in this seductive fatalism. By accepting it, we renounce something vital, something central to the very notion of our existence. We renounce even the possibility of freedom. By accepting that we are fated, we disavow responsibility for our own individual destiny. We are not accountable for our lives, we are mere pawns in the hands of fate. The way we are, the way we live, is not to our credit and not our fault. Kierkegaard is very good at detecting the subterfuges of self-delusion. In rejecting what he fundamentally believed during his student years, he had tried them all on himself. His stripping away of the layers of self-delusion points the way out of the aesthetic condition. We may find it difficult to agree with his ultimate conclusion, which was inevitably Christianity in a forbiddingly spiritual guise, but the steps by which he leads us along the way are compelling. For, most important, he is leading us out of the abyss of despair into a life where we take full responsibility for what we make of that life. The despair that Kierkegaard describes is a profound condition which has become increasingly prevalent in our time. Kierkegaard's delineations of this despair, the forms it takes, the psychological fallacies behind which it shelters, were highly prescient. His solution to it was equally radical. The only answer is to take full possession of one's existence and accept responsibility for it. This, rather than the ultimate Christian message, was Kierkegaard's most influential contribution and it was to become even more important in the century after he died, as the individual increasingly lost his faith in God, found his very existence threatened by determinist psychology, drowned in mass culture, and denied by totalitarianism, or lost in the complexities of science. Self-creation by conscious choice often seemed the only alternative to despair. In Kierkegaard's words, the way out of the abyss was to will deeply and sincerely. I have in general used the male he when outlining Kierkegaard's arguments. This does not indicate a limitation in these arguments, i.e. that they apply to only half the human race, merely a limitation in the English language. My choice of he rather than she is not entirely due to chauvinist bias, but is intended to reflect the deeply autobiographical nature of Kierkegaard's philosophy. In almost every instance, he had personally lived through the mental states, arguments, anguishes, and despairs that he describes. This leads us to the alternative to the aesthetic life, the ethical. Here, subjectivity is the absolute, and the foremost task is choosing oneself. The individual who lives the ethical life creates himself by his choice, and self-creation becomes the goal of his existence. Where the aesthetic individual merely accepts himself as he is, the ethical individual seeks to know himself and to change himself by his own choice. He will be guided in this by his self-knowledge and his willingness not to accept what he discovers, but to try to improve upon it. Here we see the categorical difference between the aesthetic and the ethical. The former is concerned with the outer world, the latter with the inner. The ethical individual seeks to know himself and tries to turn himself into something better. He aims at becoming an ideal self. Precisely why he should choose to do this is unclear, unless we accept that in getting to know himself he is bound to become enlightened and thus wish to aim for a higher life involving a set of ethical standards. What is clear 
is that the ethical individual is no longer contingent, inconsistent, or accidental. He expresses the universal in his life. In doing so, he enters the realm of fundamental categories such as good and evil, duty, and so forth. Kierkegaard's argument by which the ethical individual moves from the absolute of subjectivity to this universal way of life is scarcely convincing. It assumes that we automatically recognize the ethical as superior, and that we are thus naturally attracted to it. As I have pointed out, twentieth-century psychology questions the former, and the latter implication involves the oldest moralistic fallacy of them all. That is, when we recognize something as good, we feel we ought to do it. But Kierkegaard makes his basic distinction between the aesthetic and the ethical clear enough. One is outer, contingent, inconsistent, and self-dissipating. The other is inner, necessary, consistent, and self-creating. This is convincing, apart from one basic flaw. We can never live an exclusively ethical life. There will always necessarily be an element of the outer and accidental about our lives. Even when we have chosen the ethical, an element of the aesthetic is bound to remain. By a process of dialectic, this very unsatisfactoriness concerning the ethical now brings about a third viewpoint, which is a synthesis of the previous two opposites, the aesthetic and the ethical. This Kierkegaard calls the religious, and he deals with it in his next book, Fear and Trembling, written under the pseudonym of Johannes de Silentio. In this work, Kierkegaard examines the notion of faith. This he characterizes as the ultimate subjective act. It is irrational, a leap beyond all possible justification. It has nothing to do with ethics or good behavior. The ethical life, with its notion of self-creation and responsible choice, is unable fully to accommodate the leap of faith. Such higher irrationality lies beyond the ethical, which requires rational behavior. Faith relates the individual to something higher, which is itself the essence of everything ethical. According to Kierkegaard, the ethical life is basically concerned with religion in the social sense, but to achieve the religious state requires a teleological suspension of the ethical. In other words, it is necessary to suspend our ethical standards so that we can transcend them and fulfill a deeper purpose. According to Kierkegaard, the religious can be viewed as a dialectical synthesis of the aesthetic and the ethical. It combines both the inner and the outer life, certainty and uncertainty, the leap of faith extending beyond all certainty. Kierkegaard illustrates the religious state through the story of Abraham and Isaac from the Bible. To test his faith, God directs Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. This book is continued on Disc 2. Kierkegaard in 90 Minutes by Paul Strathern continued. Disc 2. Such an act can only be seen as ethically wrong, but true faith, the requirement of the religious stage, involves divine purpose, which supersedes all mere ethical demands. Abraham sets out to follow God's command, regardless of any qualms he may have over such an act. In this he is leading a life at the religious level, which is higher than the ethical because it has faith in the divinity from which the ethical originates. Many will rightly regard such an attitude as dangerous lunacy. Religious fanatics throughout history have behaved in this fashion. Likewise, Führers and tyrants have obeyed similar psychological dictates, and it is psychology that is the key to this problem. Kierkegaard's only real defense here is that he is dealing with a dialogue of the soul rather than a public act. Look upon Abraham and Isaac as different elements of the same person, and it all becomes not only clearer, but even plausible. Sacrifice is necessary if we wish to achieve something. This sacrifice is usually irrational and may well conflict with our previously understood notions of right and wrong. Subjectively, we often discover our purpose in life through an irrational leap of faith which has little or nothing to do with the ethical. Kierkegaard relates this to the religious, but it is also how anyone gives his life a consuming purpose, by believing in himself, as anything from an artist to a future prime minister or a stand-up comedian. As Kierkegaard put it, 
a poet's life begins in conflict with the whole of existence. Kierkegaard dwells at great length on the story of Abraham and Isaac, and it's not hard to see why. Once again, there are strong echoes of his break with Regine. As we have seen, this may have appeared wrong in the ethical sense, but Kierkegaard...